Hello, good afternoon and a warm welcome to CEB. My name is Lisa Hall. I'm Professor of Analytical Biotechnology here in Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. And it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome you virtually to this department. We're a very multidisciplinary department and we like to think that we have capability from engineering the small molecule right to the whole process. And in this conversation this afternoon, we're going to discover how far we have been able to explore and take our capabilities during this COVID-19 pandemic. But we were reminded that the world's bigger than just Cambridge. And I'd like to introduce Lara Allen to you, who pointed us in a bigger direction. Lara, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Lisa. So um, I'm Lara and I am, um, I'm the CEO of the Centre for Global Equality, which is a, an organisation based in Cambridge um, that focuses on what we call inclusive innovation. Um, we're basically Cambridge's international development network. So we bring together academics and students and businesses and NGO people to work together in a collaborative way, basically to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, <clears throat> and you very kindly um, have given uh, the Centre for Global Equality a foothold in the university by um, enabling us to establish an, an inclusive innovation programme in the department. It's for the benefit of the whole university, but it's established in the department. Um, because of your outward facing, you've always done stuff mm. with industry. And so it was a very easy step and very easy for us to come in and interact with people in the department around questions that are not just about economic gain, but also about people and about the environment. Um, I'm very involved in the census doctoral training program. And so when Axel, I know Axel from, from the CDT, and he said to me, there's a bunch of us who are thinking of um, designing a ventilator for the UK pandemic ventilator challenge. Um, so I said to him what I always say, which is, that's wonderful. And what about the rest That's of the world? The rest of the world. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that is pretty much whenever someone in the department comes with a really wonderful new piece of science or advanced technology, I'm always saying, oh, how could that be used to benefit people? You know, the, the four billion people in the world who live on less than four dollars a day. How could this new science or technology make their lives easier? So it, it was not an unusual response, but it's been a very unusual and very rewarding project, um, which we've called OVSI, um, which stands for Open Ventilator System Initiative. Um, and there's a story behind each one of those words. So tell me the bigger scope of what you're doing and, and how it interfaces with the university as a whole and, and outside the university. Well, I suppose we're um, about 70 to 80 percent of the work that we do and the projects that we do are with the University of Cambridge academics. Um, but legally, we sit outside the university, um, which enables us to bring on board in an equal way um, people from other institutions, whether that's other universities in the UK or businesses or NGOs or multilaterals or universities in, um, in African countries. So we have um, strong relationships with two universities, one in Kenya and one in Ethiopia, um, who are also, like CEB, um, hosting inclusive innovation programs. And that means that we've got these nodes of people in these different universities who are all thinking about innovation in the same way um, and therefore who work together very easily. Um, and that has made it possible to have a team of engineers based here um, in Cambridge and then a team of engineers in, in Kenya at the University of Nairobi and um, Bahadai University in Ethiopia. And now that we're all getting used to Zoom, 
it is actually in some ways becoming easier to work together because we're all forced to do it so we we're getting better so it's at become it. the norm rather than something that you just do on a friday afternoon yes yes absolutely yep. and how did the project take off did, are these the teams that have been involved in in africa or have you also involved other teams so so the ventilator i mean everyone was focusing on the ventilator itself in in mm. march and april um, and that was, you know, very strongly uh, driven at the university from the Whittle Lab, and I'm sure people will talk about that, um, and with strong um, um, interactions and guidance from intensive care specialists. But what's been very exciting from a CEB point of view has actually been the concentrator, the oxygen mm -hmm. concentrator project, because um, on doing just a little bit of background work, we realized that while ventilators are key, in fact, if you don't have a supply of oxygen, it's not very helpful. And only 20% of the African, the, the hospitals in Africa have piped oxygen. So if you want oxygen, either for a ventilator, um, which is necessary for op normal operations, um, or as we've learned as the pandemic has evolved, um, in fact, oxygen therapy without invasive ventilation is key for a very large portion of uh, patient population. So just providing a supply of oxygen um, is likely to save many lives. The, the way in which we're doing the concentrator project um, is not just designing a very exciting concentrator based on research coming out of CEB, but it's evolving a model of interaction, a way of in, of co-creating this kind of thing so that what we invent really is context appropriate. It really is what the end users want and need in, in the countries that they're intended for because they're involved in the design from the beginning. And is that the secret to to these developments that are that bridge continents and, and and bridge cultures to have teams at both ends. Well, it's definitely part of the secret. Um, I mean, if if you want to use innovative new science and technology to really address those intransigent project problems that we just haven't managed to solve and that we're going to need to solve if nine billion of us are mm. going to fit in one one world um, there's the opportunity of this new science which is um, enjoyed by the educated elite of the world and whether that's people at cambridge university or um, leading scientists in um, african universities or elsewhere it's a very small portion of the population who have the understanding of what that science can offer mm -hmm. and then there's the people that need that new thing mm -hmm. and then there's what we would call the intermediaries the the NGOs or the governments and the people who make it possible to get that new widget or approach or whatever it is to who needs it so whether you start with the challenge or whether you start with the opportunity of the new science I don't I personally don't think it matters as long as it feeds into what we call a co-creation cycle, so which is a fancy you, so way you for can a join the bits together. If you don't dialogue, if you don't iteratively try something, have a conversation. If it doesn't do have that sort of iterative um, evolution, it's never going to be exactly what's needed. And so you need scientists in country. You need scientists here. You need to be talking all the time from the beginning the beginning with end users, a human-centered design approach. Mm -hmm. So let's hear some more about the development of the ventilator. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Axel Zeitler. Axel, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and the research that you normally do? Right, yes, that's a good point. So um, in the department, I the professor for microstructure engineering, and my research really is more on spectroscopy, 
developing tools to characterize materials and predominantly in the pharmaceutical industry. So really nothing to do with um, airflows of any, of any um, sort um, or, or ventilators indeed. So how did you come to send your efforts in the direction of, of ventilators? Well, I, I suppose in many ways it's a good example for how the university in Cambridge is working in different ways to other places and that we have the departments where we do all of our day-to-day -day research and have our research groups. But at the same time, of course, we have the positions in, in college as well. So I'm a, a fellow in Gonville Keys College and, and when the lockdown happened, there was a very lively discussion really going um, around between the, the medics in the college and the scientists and the engineers. And so at that point, a lot of the discussion was really focusing on disease modeling, but it got us talking how to respond with regards to the predicted shortfall of ventilators, even in the UK. So there was a lot going on um, and it was really by chance in that way. But then uh, within a few days of, of um, thought, really we had a team together. So that was quite remarkable. So the, the process from coming up with, oh, wouldn't this be a good idea to having a first call to bring people together from really different variety of roles to actually putting something together in the lab was um, within a few days. Yeah. I think we've got a, a video of, of some of the developments. Are you able to talk us through it a little bit of, of what's been put together and, and, and how it all works? Yeah, so in a way, um, when we got the permission by the engineering department to use the Whittle Laboratory, um, that was, I think, on a Friday afternoon. And um, over from Friday to, to Monday morning, the, the team of engineers in the Whittle Laboratory started to take this initial design that, that Tash um, had developed um, or that he thought about and, and tested it first of all with very simple um, tools that they could find in the lab, or not simple tools, but very simple um, components that they could find in the laboratory. Um, so tubes that were lying around, um, the, the mixing time for the oxygen and the air were, were empty um, drinks bottles. Um, and, you know, I mean, there were sort of jubilee clips being used to, to uh, bolt things together. So it was a real sort of garage type project in terms of how it looked like, but the design was already a really good one. And so this was really a proof of concept within a few days. Can we, can we fit into what the um, pandemic ventilator challenge for the UK would, would require us to do? And at the same time, we were having the discussion um, with Lara Allen from the um, Centre for Global Equality really highlighting, well, um, if we want to make a big difference, we need to look further um, in, 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 into Africa as well, um, maybe as, as one area of interest, um, really pointing us to, to the need there. Um, but also we had a connection with um, intensive care medics from Addenbrooks who, who have experience in, in, in working in African uh, countries. And, and, and Tashif Ramzander from the um, Grainbridge Aerothermal, who had come up with the design originally as well, he had links back to South Africa as well um, to their intensive care medics there. So we started to think really quickly, okay, we, we, can, we can come up with a design that complies with the, with the minimum requirement um, that we would need in the, in the West to, to um, keep a patient alive for a few hours, a few days even. Um, but it became very, clear, uh, very quickly, it became clear that we needed something quite a bit more sophisticated. Because interestingly, um, uh, while a simple ventilator is, is um, useful in, in Western countries where a patient can be moved on from an initial stage of, of keeping a patient alive to then um, uh, being transferred to um, an intensive care uh, ventilator, um, uh, that infrastructure simply doesn't exist in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are too few ventilators around. Um, so it became clear that we, we needed to do something slightly more sophisticated really than what was required here. Um, and Tash's design was really beautiful in, the, in that regard and that it was adaptable. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't confined to operating in, in one mode. Um, uh, so it could do different types of ventilation to the patient. Um, and it also was very um, resourceful with the amount of oxygen needed to um, supply to a patient. So it, it could be deployed in an environment where uh, little resource was available. Mm -hmm. When it became clear that the design was working, um, the, the team at the Whittle um, then started to rapidly prototype um, this design into something a little bit more um, manufacturable. 
So they started to 3D print new parts. Um, they looked at the supply chain, um, what, what's available in parts, which parts are becoming scarce, because of course all different countries started to produce ventilators or started to explore how to produce ventilators, which meant, which meant that people were after components everywhere around the world. So um, even though you can come up with a design that, that works really nicely, it's of no use, of course, in a pandemic if you can't source the component. And I think this is really what set our project apart from other initiatives that started um, forming during this period. And that we had this guidance through our industrial partners, through our partners in Africa, but also through the experience of the guys in the Whittle Laboratory who knew how to bring something from a prototype to something that can actually be manufactured. Something that could fly, metaphorically and literally. <laughs> Absolutely. So they were very inventive in, in, in bringing in the, the knowledge they had from fluid dynamics, um, how certain airflows work in, in these components they normally design, how they could bring in this knowledge into making um, a ventilator more robust, relying on less components, more mechanical control rather than lots of fancy mm -hmm. electronics that can fail. So really stripping back the functionality to what's needed but making it the best it can be. And in many ways, um, the, the ventilator um, the teams come up with is, is, is just an amazingly stable system. So it, it really doesn't lag behind the performance of, of far more sophisticated systems, but potentially at a fraction of the price and, and in a way that can be produced um, in, in South Africa, for instance, um, and, and other countries in, in, in due course. And uh, Professor Jeff Mogridge, became involved at 1.2, didn't he? And he normally is designing heart valves. Absolutely, and there was already a, a great um, collaboration going on because the heart valves that um, Jeff is, is, is um, uh, designing, they get machined, the parts for the injection molding process already get um, machined in the Whittle laboratory. So there was a really nice overlap in that um, the team, again, the people involved knew one another already, but that, that way, made a big difference now because the, the second prototype was then a system that was 3D printed, so rapidly prototyped into fancier components, um, uh, thinking about how to, how to make it manufacturable. But 3D printing isn't really a process that can scale very nicely, but also the, the air tightness of what you print um, with the 3D printer and the compatibility of the polymers that you can print to medical grade oxygen and all the regulatory requirements that come with a, um, a medical device of that nature um, are really incompatible. So it's um, important to move from that 3D printing to a process that can scale. And injection molding is, is the prime process um, that, that can be used in, in, in this context or that is used to make components of that nature. And Jess Group is, is specializing on how you select the right materials, how you um, make the process of injection molding work for those medical devices. Um, he also knows um, how important the regulatory aspects are, so the material selection and, and, and the, the process itself, how it, how it comes together to make components that can be used in a ventilator. So his group um, really jumped into the, uh, into the challenge and um, it was amazing. I mean, one, beautiful aspect that I found of, of, of OFSI, of this consortium that came together, was that it really included um, uh, technicians, undergraduate students, graduate mm -hmm. students, postdocs, academics, industrial partners, people uh, from medical teams in the ICU ward that would dial in in the evening after they finished their shift, um, people from across Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, South Africa, industrial context. So it, it's a, this huge diversity of, of, of people and enthusiasm that, that came together was really inspiring. And all seeded because we meet together in our colleges for lunch very often. Absolutely. And I think that is, um, that is really difficult to, to um, uh, overestimate, really, that, that, yes. that link between people and understanding what people do and how to approach them and, and you know, that, that personal interaction and trust that's needed, in particular when a project like this starts from the bottom up. There was no funding in place to, to get this project off the ground. Everybody chipped in with what they had. And of course, that requires a, a level of trust that you would really find difficult mm -hmm. to build otherwise. Yeah. Yes, I always say that if I need to know something that's outside my field, I'll go and have lunch in college because yes. there would be somebody who can help me. 
Absolutely. And of course, at Keys, we're very proud of our dining tradition. So we are, <laughs> um, we are, we are very um, excited about um, uh, that aspect in our community. And it, at Queen's too. But of, but of course, that's all at a stop for the moment. <laughs> so tell me, where is the ventilator project now? Well, so where we're at now is, is that we um, were able to translate our prototypes um, to a manufacturable design together with partners in, in Banbury, um, uh, a commercial company called um, ProDrive, automotive um, uh, company that um, equally had um, a, a hiatus during the lockdown. They were looking for challenges um, to take on and introduction were made through um, a team on, uh, on the, on the Offsea project um, and they got a whole team of engineers to, to take our design um, that we developed in the Whittle Laboratory into something that could be uh, further um, linked into supply chains in the automotive industry because of course we thought when we started out our, our motivation was to come up with a Toyota pickup truck of ventilators so something that is robust that's reliable that can be repaired in the field that is um, really a, a trusted sort of companion um, that will work for, for, for years to come and, and that link with the automotive industry uh, was quite deliberate as well because we thought if, if the supply chains in the medical field um, collapsed during the pandemic. Um, the automotive um, side, they can't provide all the parts at medical grade, but a lot of the parts that don't need to be medical grade to control the system, to bring it together, they would still be available. Mm. So our partners at ProDrive were really helpful um, to, to bring that design up a notch. And then in parallel, we were very fortunate that um, at, the, at the Whittle team, we had a colleague, um, an engineer on board from Beko, and um, Beko is a, is a leading Turkish um, white goods manufacturer in Europe, of course. Um, but they had um, contacts through their, um, through their corporate structure with a subsidiary of Beko called DeFi in South Africa. Now, when we came up with this design and when we refined the design in the Whittle Laboratory, it became evident quite quickly that this isn't a device that would be suitable to be manufactured in a sort of a maker space yeah. type environment. This is a serious um, production effort um, and, and a, a considerable infrastructure is needed to, to make it, but also to get it through regulation because that regulatory process for a ventilator is not just the design, but also the manufacturing process, the production line to it. And so they, uh, Beko um, uh, saw the opportunity in, the, in this design and um, was so impressed by what um, the group had done that they got um, us in, uh, introductions to, to DeFi in South Africa. And DeFi has been building um, uh, further productionizing in this three-way relationship between um, the Whittle Laboratory team of Offsi, um, uh, ProDrive in, in Banbury and, and uh, DeFi down in South Africa. They've been taking this design forward and they've now iterated it to a pre-production stage where they've been recently just building 20 units in South Africa. Um, that are, they've gone back to, one or two of those units have come back to the UK. They've been tested at the National Physics Laboratory. And um, they are that good now that um, one of the units is staying there as a reference um, ventilator uh, for, for the NPL. Um, but a little bit more work is needed on the electronics side, on the control electronics, because that's a big um, challenge in the, in the regulatory process. But we're, we're hopeful that the regulatory process in South Africa is, is going to um, uh, commence soon and that uh, we, we will have a device ready um, in the near future that, that is both um, performing well, but is also known to be safe and tested and, and there's a production line for it and um, it can be scaled. So it seems that oxygen supplies are also a potential problem in this. And so I'd like to introduce my colleague, David. David, over to you. Please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So my name is uh, David, David Fairen Jimenez. I'm a reader at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. And the field of expertise we have is basically we work with porous materials and we try to develop new materials for gas storage, gas separation applications. Traditionally, we have been working on applications such as uh, carbon capture or hydrogen storage, but we also saw uh, a, a, an important opportunity here on this COVID-19 crisis uh, where we can try to use all the knowledge and uh, know-how we have and try to help 
the society uh, by providing materials who can uh, separate uh, oxygen from nitrogen. So tell us a bit more about what you did and how you went about making this happen. I think something that was quite important here is that we also had some experience uh, with industry. So we have been working uh, for many, many years with different industrial companies, uh, trying to see how can we really translate the materials we develop in the lab to a manufacturer and how can we really start uh, producing this on mass scale. We also had a spin-out company, so we had a way to be able to develop a full network of people, a consortium of uh, different companies and different expertises, trying to bring these materials into reality. And what sort of progress have you managed to make? So it was a very uh, interesting project because obviously we had all the expertise from the material science side, but we didn't have the expertise on the uh, mechanical engineering process, for example, uh, trying to develop a, a rig, uh, trying to do that some testing, trying to really be able to create uh, this equipment and have something that is not only working in the lab on a gram scale, but something that can really help here and produce uh, liters of oxygen, pure oxygen. So far in the last uh, five, four months, we have uh, been developing this testing rig. And by last week, we are almost done with the test rig. So now we are really moving into the next phase, which is really start with the testing of the, of the rig. Once this is tested, then the next steps are going to be uh, producing a prototype, okay? We will try to say, okay, what is going to be the best conditions for the oxygen-nitrogen separation? How can we really produce this? And uh, what is really required in order to start uh, sharing this, these ideas? And do you anticipate that this will link in with the ventilator and so that you have a, a fully integrated oxygen producing and ventilating system? So this is one of the beauty, I mean, this is a little bit the beauty of this project. It is not only about creating a ventilator or an oxygen concentrator or different solutions. What I really like it was the idea of being able to link all these different ideas people were working on at the University of Cambridge and in our department in particular. So this connects very well with the ventilator because whenever you need to use a ventilator, you will need to use an oxygen concentrator just to produce the, the amount of oxygen that the patient will need. But this is also even more important than just the ventilator because many patients that don't require a, a ventilator or a CPAP uh, or, or a much more um, intrusive system, they will still benefit from having a supply of oxygen. And this is really, really important. So you can have many patients, they don't need to go to this intensive care uh, beds, they don't need to have the ventilator installed, but they just need to have a, a little bit of help with an extra supply of oxygen. Um, in particular in Africa, which is this project is really focusing at, we have seen that ventilators are important. Yes, there is a need for that, but there is a huge need for oxygen. And this is also going for COVID-19, but for also future uh, medical problems. I mean, oxygen in Africa is, is, a, is, a, is an important problem that we uh, people need to solve. Something that is also uh, very important is the fact that in order to be able to really understand what needs to be, what is required for uh, developing this oxygen concentrator. I mean, I'm talking about the collaborations we have in, in, in around Cambridge, so CV, different industrial partners, but something that is very important is also this collaboration we have uh, with the people in, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, and also in Ethiopia. So we are working with the universities there. I mean, we are really trying to develop a good collaboration with the people from Ethiopia in particular. We are trying to have the same uh, test rig. So we are using the same kind of device. We can really try to see what are the challenges they will have, what are the challenges we will have, and how can we really solve them. With the people from Kenya uh, in Nairobi, we they, they, they have a slightly different uh, device that is based on the same ideas. And still, we will collaborate, providing the, the zeolite materials and trying to see 
again, what are the problems they are going to have, the problems we are going to have, how can we really solve all them? Then the next step will be to start uh, producing the, 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 the equipment. And for this, again, we are going to have uh, two different possibilities. We, we are going to explore both at the same time. Um, we will do some manufacturing in the UK. With Cambridge Precision in particular uh, is something we are talking to. Uh, try to see how can we really produce these, these uh, devices. With the people from uh, Ethiopia and Kenya also working with them, trying to see how can we really do uh, manufacture the, the, these equipments on site. Okay, how can we really get all the expertise that is really required. So we've heard a lot about the activities that CUB has able, been able to pull together uh, and make a real difference in relation to COVID. But we've also had other activities in, in infectious disease and biotechnology that have suddenly had a change of direction as a result of COVID. I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Jenny Malloy. Jenny. Hi. Um, so I'm a Shuttleworth Fellow in Chemical Engineering Biotechnology here in Cambridge and my research is around supply chains for molecular diagnostics and reagents for molecular biology research. So tell us something about what you've done in setting up facilities in sub-Saharan Africa. Well over the last two and a half years I've been working with colleagues to establish labs um, in Ghana and Cameroon where we can provide education for producing tools for research and also set up a manufacturing facility particularly in Cameroon in this case um, to produce the types of tools that biologists need in the lab and that they struggle to get for all sorts of reasons sometimes it's cost sometimes it's having to ship on cold chain that introduces delays sometimes stuff gets stuck in customs and so we're exploring this idea of local manufacturing of the fundamental tools that biologists need to do their work and the nice thing about that is it's the same tools that are actually directly involved in applied research and in direct healthcare applications like molecular diagnostics. So although the manufacturing conditions are different, it's the same technology. And so we're trying to come up with really good methods of manufacturing those tools in resource constrained conditions to try and increase access and, and kind of boost research and innovation in sub-Saharan Africa. And I believe you've had some rather exciting trips to the local market looking for pressure cookers and Yes. Other, other things <laughs> that you can resource locally. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're trying to really look at the entire supply chain for, for setting up molecular biology labs and where we can sort of hack it a little bit and find local producers of things that we need. And so, yeah, my postdoc, Kiara, has had some exciting trips to locate um, chemicals from shops that sell supplies for soap making, for example. So it's really trying to think, you know, what are consumer commodities that you can find easily and that are good enough for the research that we need to do. And so they're never quite the same grade as you would find from a scientific supplier. But in some cases, that's not a problem. I mean, it's enough to do what we need. Um, and so we found you know, pressure cookers make pretty effective autoclaves. Um, there's also suppliers of a whole range of chemicals for other industries that with the right quality control before you use them for, for science and research um, are much more accessible. Um, and for kind of, we've tried to ship chemicals to Cameroon during the pandemic. Um, sometimes it's been quick, sometimes it's taken up to two months. And so anything that we can do to kind of reduce the time frame just really accelerates um, the work of our colleagues and the, the ability of them to actually be innovative in what they're doing and to really take some risks and, and have the chance to explore a field um, as opposed to always being constrained to doing kind of low risk experiments because they're, they are in a, in a kind of condition of resource scarcity. And so we're trying to find innovative ways around that problem and give them the abundance of tools and resources that they need to do their best work. Local manufacturers or local production of, of anything is really important, isn't it, in, in these low income countries, these low resource areas, in enabling them to be able to purchase a, a, a medical device or any other vital piece of equipment. So, and I think it's probably a couple of years ago that we discovered the overlap between your work and, and my team's work on uh, infectious disease diagnostics. Absolutely, yes. It's, but we are thinking had converged yes. <laughs> with slightly different technology choices, but a very kind of the approach is very similar. And I think the challenge that we identified is basically the same challenge is that it's, you know, that if you're in um, a developing country 
accessing the items that you need and you know to, to focus on diagnostics for example um, you're really priced out of that market mm -hmm. and, and this has kind of been true for a very long time um, the the kind of added benefit the added value benefit of local manufacturing is also that it builds local capacity and so you're kind of it's hoping to create this virtuous cycle of being able to produce diagnostics that are suitable for the local market that are adapted to local needs that are actually affordable to the local markets as well but in doing so you're also allowing that money to be invested in the economy as opposed to being you know taken immediately overseas and invested elsewhere um, and so that's the the sort of the, the ecosystem that we want to set up is one where it's a su supportive whole and it kind of cycles in such a way that you can um, really enable access to better healthcare while also growing the economy. Of course, in the last few months, everybody's suddenly understood what a nucleic acid diagnostic is. And, and, and this is where, where my team have been active, I mean, not for COVID originally, but for malaria and dengue and leptospirosis. But it's the same technique. It's the Absolutely. same diagnostic. And, and we know that in a low income country, the, the cost of the enzyme that you need for these assays is between 60 and 85% of the total cost. And, and it's, it's expensive. It, it's ludicrously expensive for a, for a, a, a low income area because it, it's equivalent to a week to a month's food. Uh, and who's going to make that choice? So, yeah, absolutely. It, and like you say, it's ludicrous in terms of the cost of production when you think really hard about the manufacturing. And that's, I think that, you know, I, my project has always been fairly application agnostic. We wanted to produce the tools and sort mm -hmm. of let people run with them. And so it's been great to kind of team up with your group, thinking very kind of focused on molecular diagnostics as an application. I think there's so much that you can do in that space, um, even pre the current <laughs> times, yes. um, looking at all sorts of diseases. And like you say, it's, it's a very flexible tool. And so once you've kind of cracked it for one problem, um, not to trivialize the amount of work that goes into transferring it to another problem, but you know, the foundation really gives you a lot to build upon. And I think that the sort of the, the ability of um, tools to be transferred also into other areas like industrial biotechnology, like other areas of the, the kind of bioeconomy. It's just a really interesting space where you can be very led by the needs of the collaborators as well. And so you're developing interesting technology, but you can kind of be flexible to the sort of achieving the impact that you need to achieve with your partners. And I think that's a, another really nice area of working sort of both broad and narrow at the same time. It's a really exciting space to be. Yes, we discovered that uh, one of the main areas where cost increased was in the downstream processing, the isolation and the purification of the of the enzymes. And, and, and so we focused on doing something about that. And, and I think we have a, a, a short video that, that shows a, one of my team, Cassie Henderson, working in the lab and uh, and showing how we made the enzyme pink mm -hmm. so that you could see it and you could work with it without needing expensive tools. And we put a sticky tag on that stuck to sand, which you could collect from the beach. And we cut the whole processing down to a single step where the enzyme sticks to the sand. We have a nice pink sand and we can use this uh, as our enzyme for a nucleic acid diagnostic. We, of course, were working on malaria until March this year. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then, of course, our attention turned uh, and we have managed to obtain funding for us to do a clinical trial in, in Ghana. And, and we're going to be working with some of the collaborators that, that you've been working with in setting up the biotech facilities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a really good example of how kind of having those strong foundations and links in place before something like this happens mm -hmm. is really important to be able to kind of get off the ground quickly in response to a challenge like COVID. And so that's been, been really exciting to be able to bring together the right group to tackle that problem. And I think a few things about the sort of process that you set up really exemplify 
that this common approach that sort of ties a thread between our, our two projects as much as they have some differences. And that's, you know, a focus on local resources, the sand mm -hmm. readily available, um, a focus on making the biology do the heavy lifting. So, you know, a lot of these downstream processes, you're talking about chemical um, processing, you're talking about a lot of kind of different steps that are expensive, but, but also um, that require people that know have, have real expertise in doing things like attaching enzymes to <laughs> to <laughs> materials um, whereas you know taking inspiration from nature you know there are there are diatoms and there are organisms that already attach proteins to compounds like silica which is found in sand and so it's that sort of you know bio inspired mm -hmm. and allowing the biology to do most of the work for you and you just have to come in at the end and also kind of keeping that person focused so yeah having it you can see it you don't have to kind of you know as molecular biologists we get very used to working with colorless liquids tiny amounts of colorless liquids that we move around between tubes and we have to use quite sophisticated instruments to even know what they are but just having you know it's pink the enzyme is there i mean that's a fantastic kind of user focused innovation mm -hmm. that really is not only useful in low resource settings and this is another thing that's nice about yes our because work, we're enjoying <laughs> it here too exactly aren't we? yeah so it makes our work and our life in the lab and our team's life in the lab yes. easier as well so I think we've got some uh, video of the labs in, in Ghana that are currently being used for COVID testing. Uh, the facilities are, are quite meagre, aren't they, for the whole country? I believe they started with just two testing labs. Just two testing labs, although they're ramping up quite rapidly and there are still more being built in Accra and that have been moved around the country. So when we were drafting our proposal, um, the capacity was around 4,500 tests a day and that's been increased rapidly. But in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, one of the nice things about working with Ghana is that they've, um, in, in terms of other countries of their size, um, they've tested many people and they were very early and rapid with their track and trace programme. Um, they also innovated and so they were one of uh, the first countries to start using pooled samples yes, as well yes. to really increase capacity. And so that was one of the things that Ghana did very early on. And by all accounts, you know, they've, they've been um, very active in the testing space and really ramped that up. So um, although they started with just a couple of labs who rapidly developed a backlog, um, they are now setting up more and more at pace and also introducing sequencing. And, you know, the Africa CDC and other kind of bodies on the continent have really been pulling together different labs to really investigate what's going on because the dynamics of the virus in Africa are playing out somewhat mm. differently to what we're seeing in Europe and it's still a little unclear um, whether that's because of you know a different different modes of transmission whether it's because it's a younger population overall there is a lot of reasons why that might be the case um, and so there's a lot of drive now to get real research and surveillance underway um, and Ghana is kind of ahead of the game um, in terms of its neighbours because they really got off the mark pretty quickly with setting these labs up and that was one of the reasons why it's been so um, useful to work with them because we, we're going into an environment with a new test where the, the previous technique is really established and so it's going to be much easier to compare you know, whether our technique um, or the technique of our collaborators which uses a much simplified system for molecular testing and then our local manufacturing locally made enzymes um, really work so so I'm excited to be to be in that environment and engaging also with you know people at the government level and the sort of UN agencies in Ghana to really understand how it all fits together. So as of next month we will be taking diagnostic kits out to Ghana uh, we will be training the Ghanaians in production of the enzyme for a nucleic acid test for COVID-19. Uh, and we will be seeing whether a test which is where the materials are produced in Ghana uh, can compete with the gold standard test. So Axel, it's been strange times, hasn't it? We've We've learned new ways of working. We've discovered that as a department, we really can use our multidisciplinarity and that our capabilities to tackle problems are uh, exciting. It has really. I mean, it's been, it's been very strange indeed, but at the same time, this may be has made us all think a bit differently about what we do, how we do it, 
why we want to do certain types of research and how we can come together as a department to build uh, an interesting or to, to, to take this opportunity now to, to bring us into a different um, direction. I mean, for years, we've been um, leading in, in many fields of chemical engineering and biotechnology. And that's a core competency that we don't want to give up. And, and we all very strongly feel, of course, that our discipline makes um, a meaningful impact to, to our society um, and, and to the wider world. But there are these, these really exciting opportunities how we can maybe take forward chemical engineering and biotechnology into different areas that um, by the very nature of our different skills and, and the connections we can make here uh, in Cambridge and beyond wouldn't be otherwise possible. And this sort of pause that we all had to go through, that, that sort of um, moment of, of taking a breath and, and reorienting has been quite refreshing in some way. It certainly, certainly has. The, the voyage of discovery probably began for us even before COVID when we realised that we had such a rich diversity of capability here uh, and the projects that many of us were involved in were really contributing to the global challenges, I think particularly in healthcare and energy. It, and it's been a, a, a wonderful uh, experience to actually have to put those capabilities on the table and bring them together in different mixtures and discover that the, the sum of the parts is, is much greater than we ever imagined. It's absolutely right. I think we've, we've started some sort of um, a process of redefining where we wanted to go strategically. We had a strategic research review not long ago. We've been soul searching a little bit, of course, the, the challenges around um, climate change um, are intricately linked to, to um, what we do in the department in terms of opportunities where we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. But this has really been a catalyzing moment, I guess, in, in that we have been starting to think wider already. Um, we've been making connections. We've been um, uh, taking stock of what we've done and what capability we've got. But the situation we, we found ourselves in really gave us this moment of, OK, let's let's do something. Let's move forward and, and rather than um, worry about what we can't do, see what we can do and where it can take us. And so that's a really exciting journey, I think, that I hope this is the start, and I'm sure this mm. is the start of um, us as a department and, and maybe also the wider chemical engineering and biotechnology community in the UK can, can take this, this challenge on and, and, and make something of it. Well, there's such an enormous talent pool here that uh, finding those people who can contribute to a, an effort is... Uh, it is liberating, I think, for, for all of us, so that it takes us out of our, our, our department, it takes us out of the work that we're usually doing and has given us a, a great opportunity to explore our limits further.